Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Bible study here at uh, Colonial Hill Baptist Church. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. If you have your Bibles there with you, would you please open those to Genesis chapter 27. Uh, our focal verses are 18 through 30. 18 through 30, this is a very familiar story to, to most of us that were raised in the church, but uh, we, we will attempt to glean new insights, greater wisdom from a, an all too familiar story. Let's open in prayer. Father, we ask you to guide us here today. Help us to see things as we recount the episode of Isaac and Jacob. Jacob stole his brother's birthright and his blessing. Father, please help us to see things we haven't seen before. Give us wisdom that we desperately need, Lord, to be more like you and to be obedient in every way to you. Thank you, God, for the privileges that are ours. Thank you for the rain that we had uh, this week. And we thank you for the blessings that you continue to pour out on us. These things I pray in Christ's name, Lord. Amen. Well, hopefully you have found your place there in the 27th chapter of Genesis. Let me uh, begin our study by recounting a story given by one of the sources that is provided to me. Uh, this is a story told to the author by a man that he called Jim. Jim. Not me, but another Jim. And uh, this Jim felt that he never quite met his father's expectation. You see, his father was a banker, a very successful, highly respected man in the community. His mother was very much involved in volunteer work. Um, all kinds of charities and very much involved in their church. His sister also went into banking, was married, had two children, and was quite successful. But Jim's path, uh, life took a, a very different path. He went to college, graduated, went on to seminary, where he majored in church music. And Jim was gifted with a very good voice and um, was devoted to the Lord. He also had a great personality, was very well liked and very outgoing. Jim was in his 40s at the time that the event we're going to recount took place and at that point had not yet married, although he would later on. Jim really threw himself into his ministry. He led multiple church choirs, youth, children, adults, in a very small church, because there was very little money, he worked part-time at his denomination's uh, headquarters. He also worked a third job, part-time job, to raise enough money to take care of himself. But in spite of all that Jim did, he felt like that he was a disappointment to his father. Because he never, never did become the head of a large corporation, which is what Jim thought that his father wanted him to be. Jim's dad became critically ill. He was hospitalized. The family was called in. They were told that the time of death was near. The entire family was gathered bedside as Jim's father drew his last breath. And apparently died. Everyone was crying. Then, then, shockingly, Jim's dad took a big gulp of air, opened his eyes, looked straight at Jim and said, son, I have always been so proud of you. Then he was gone. Jim told this account to the person that wrote wrote it down, and he said, the author said, that Jim had tears running down his face as he recounted the story. And Jim told the author, I'm convinced that God allowed my dad to come back 
and tell me that because God knew that's exactly, exactly what I needed to hear. Most of us are like Jim. We long for our parents' blessings. Uh, for us boys, it's wanting our dad to be proud of us. And we're going to read a story today that is quite different than Jim's story, where one son tricks his dad into giving him a blessing that rightfully belonged to the other son. And they were twins, most of you know. So quickly, looking at the background material here, Genesis chapter 25, verses 19 through 27, verse 46. God's covenant, which was given to Abraham, as we know, continued through Isaac. Isaac was told that his heirs would be as plentiful as the stars in the sky. Same lineage that God had promised his dad Abraham that he would have. However, after 20 years of marriage to Rebekah, their prayer for a child had not been answered. And unlike his father and mother, Isaac did not resort to a concubine. He continued to pray and the prayer was answered. Rebecca was to have a, a child. Found out later it was not going to be a child. It was going to be two children. She knew that her pregnancy consisted of a very, very active child, and then she learned, no, it was actually two children. And uh, each would become the head or the leader of a great nation, God revealed to Rebecca before they were born. And the um, younger would be the leader or the head of the older. Or to say that in a different language, the older would serve the younger. That was pointed out to Rebecca before the children were born. And once they were born, conflict began between the two and continued throughout most of their lives up until late adulthood. Esau was the firstborn. He was extremely hairy. Scripture tells us he was of a red complexion, and he was very much an outdoorsman. He liked to hunt. He liked to uh, prepare the wild game that he killed. And his dad, uh, Isaac, liked to eat that game. Jacob, on the other hand, was a person who liked to stay closer to home. He was more interested in uh, things that happened around the house and maybe a little bit of farming. So they were as different as two children could be. Now, the first contention between the brothers occurred when Esau came in from a long hunt. He was famished. He thought he was about to die of starvation. Jacob had just prepared some lentil stew, and Esau traded his birthright for the lentil stew. Now, the birthright meant that he would be the head of the household after his father's death. Two-thirds of the estate would come to him with the understanding that uh, he would be responsible for caring for his mother and any other children that might be in the family. As far as we know, there were only the two. We have no information that uh, either Isaac nor Rebecca ever had any other children. So Rebecca was uh, content that her younger had gain the, the uh, birthright, but the second issue was the father's blessing, which is different from the birthright. This was a blessing that was bestowed on the father, normally to the oldest son, and passing on to him certain blessings that he would want, want the Lord to fulfill in this uh, person's life. So, 
The second issue was the one that we're going to take a look at today. It is the issue where Rebecca schemes to have Jacob, the younger son, receive the blessing that rightfully belonged to Esau, the older son. And uh, she, she plays the major role in what happens here. And when uh, verses coming before our focal verses, when Jacob balked a little bit at, no, he would receive a curse from his dad if his dad found out who he was. She said, no, the curse will be on me. So she knew that she was taking the lead in doing something that wasn't, wasn't right. So with that background, we take a look at the focal verses. We're going to look at verses 18 through 21st because that's the way they're divided up in the quarterly and uh, these verses come under the heading in the quarterly of the trap is set the trap is set and that's exactly what has happened now before the verses we're looking at here uh, Esau is old he's blind He's in poor health. He calls Isaac, he calls Esau in and tells him that he wants him to go kill him some game and prepare his favorite dish for him. And uh, when he does, he will, he, Isaac, will bless Esau, give him the family blessing. And so Esau leaves to go on the hunt Rebecca overhears what's going on and she moves quickly to steal the blessing for her favorite son and that is where we pick up with the verses that we'll be looking at now. As I said, under the heading, the trap is set. So we look at verses 18 through 20. When he came to his father, he here is Jacob, when he came to his father, he said, My father, and he answered, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob replied to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How did you ever find it so quickly, my son? He replied, because the Lord your God made it happen for me. Wow. Wow. A lot of uh, untruths in what Jacob is saying here to his father. He very blatantly violated two of the commandments here and others later on. First of all, he lied. He told something other than the truth. And secondly... He dishonored his father in doing so. so. There's two of the commandments, which of course haven't been written at the time of the story, but uh, Moses was given the law some years later and would formulate those Ten Commandments. So he was not Esau, and he definitely wasn't the firstborn. That's lie number one. Second, he told Isaac, I have done as you told me. No, he hadn't told Isaac to do, or he hadn't told Jacob to do anything. He had told Esau, but he hadn't told him. And thirdly, it was not game that he had. His mother, Rebecca, had had him get two goats. They killed him, and then she prepared them in a way that she knew that Isaac really liked them. So they, they were not wild game. They were domestic goats. Now, we note in the way that Jacob talks to his father that there seems to be a sense of urgency in what he's saying. And we can understand why. Esau has gone on a hunt. Jacob doesn't know when he's going to come back, doesn't know if he's going to catch him in the middle of his ploy. So, yes, he's trying to move this thing along uh, as fast as he can. So he tells Isaac, sit up and eat so you can bless me. <laughs> As I say, 
trying to make things happen quickly. Uh, the only truth in this whole thing is that uh, at least Jacob stated his desire. He wanted his father's blessing. The blessing now, as I mentioned earlier, is separate from the birthright. Both are extremely important, but uh, in this case, the birthright's already been sold, so he's only trying to get the blessing that rightfully belongs to Esau. So Isaac's question about how he found the game so quickly indicates, at least to me, that he's suspicious of what's going on here. He appears to sense that everything's not quite on the up and up. So uh, Jacob's reply involved violating another one of the commandments that would come later on. He misused God's name. He said, the Lord, your God, made it possible. Well, two things there. First of all, God had nothing to do with what has happened. And secondly, he doesn't say my God. He says your God. And there's clear evidence that at this point in his life, he was not the God of Jacob's life. God did not have any relationship at all with him. So using Miss misusing God's name. He uses it in vain. It's blasphemy, the highest form of sin. So with that background, we move now to the next group of focal verses under the heading in the quarterly of deception carried out. Deception carried out. This deception has been created by uh, Rebecca and Jacob. And now we're going to see it being fulfilled. Picking up with verse 21. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come closer so I can touch you, my son. Are you really my son Esau or not? So Jacob came closer to his father Isaac. When he touched him, he said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he blessed him. Again he asked, Are you really my son Esau? And he replied, I am. Then he said, Bring it closer to me and let me eat some of my son's game so that I can bless you. Jacob brought it closer to him and he ate. He brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Please come closer and kiss me, my son. So he came closer and kissed him. When Isaac smelled his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. Wow. Beginning with verses that aren't in our focal verses, the, the use of repetition is used for emphasis in Hebrew language. My son is used multiple times in this narrative. The first two times are not in our focal verses, and the first two times my son is spoken by Isaac to Esau. He called him my son when he asked Esau to go kill some game, and then after the ploy is found out, in the verses that come after our focal verses, uh, Isaac once again refers to him as my son. So for emphasis, that's used, and then my son is used multiple times, as you've already heard in the verses that were used here. Initially, when asked, who are you, my son, Jacob over-answered the question. He not only said, I am Esau, but he went on and said, I am your firstborn. Another lie. But uh, he's going to find out here in a moment that he shouldn't say any more than he absolutely has to. So beyond this point, he's going to say only what is absolutely essential and no more. Because Esau recognizes the voice, even though... Uh, Rebecca has put goatskin on his hands and on the back of his neck to 
fool um, Isaac into believing that this is Esau, who was very hairy. So the statement that that um, Isaac makes here, are you really my son or not, is with a question mark in the scripture. Some think it should not be with a question mark. It should be a statement, not that uh, Isaac is asking. He probably senses that he's not. But anyway, be that as it may, at this point, Jacob was clearly keeping his distance from his dad. And from this point on, he's not going to speak any more than he absolutely has to. So Jacob obeyed his father's command when he said, come closer. Isaac touched him, and that created more confusion because he felt the hair on the back of his son's hands, which really was goat hair, and said, um, the hands are the hands of Esau, even though the voice is the voice of Jacob. So it was pretty clear that Isaac was somewhat leery of what was taking place here. So Jacob obeyed his father's command. He did what his father told him to, but no more than what his father told him to. And even though the verse says he blessed him. That is not the blessing. It may be a blessing, but it's not the blessing which comes up in verse 27. We will read that here in a moment. So, again, Isaac asked, Are you really my son Esau? Clearly, Isaac knows that something's not right here, and he is trying to figure this out. So Jacob kept his talk to an absolute minimum. He says one word. It's actually two words in our translation, but in the Hebrew it's one word. He answered that question by saying, I am, which I say in English, that's two words. In uh, Hebrew, it's one. And that's all the record we have of him talking beyond this point. He says nothing else in the rest of the episode that takes place here between he and his dad. So Isaac had Jacob bring the game to him, bring it closer, let him eat some of it. Uh, he, When he requests the game, the word he used could be translated venison which would mean that uh, he was expecting his son to have killed some form of deer. In any case, when he tasted the goat, he did not discern that it wasn't venison, that it was goat. And uh, one commentator said maybe it was because the wine that he was given with a meal dulled his taste somewhat, and that's possible. In any case, uh, he did not pick up on the fact that this was not wild game, but domesticated goat. The request for a kiss, the uh, different sources are not real clear about this. Was this normal when a blessing was going to be given? Or was it another attempt by Isaac to determine for certain who this was that he was talking to? In any case, uh, he does ask uh, who is Jacob, though he thinks it's Esau, to come closer so he can have a final test to determine who he is. Some think that this final test was the one that convinced Isaac that this was Esau, and so he would carry through with the blessing that he does, in fact, impart to his son. Now, uh, having known a few people who have suffered the loss of one sense, one of their senses, the other senses tend to become stronger as that sense weakens or disappears altogether. So, 
very likely that Isaac's sense of smell had actually improved after his loss of his eyesight. When he smells his son, who happens to be Jacob, though he thinks it's Esau, the clothes that Jacob was wearing were actually the clothes of Esau. Re Rebecca had taken care of that. She had clothed them in the finest clothes, the scripture says, of Esau. And these, of course, carried with them the uh, odor of the outdoor where he spent his time as a hunter. And so when, when uh, Isaac smells the this clothes, he realizes, or he thinks he realizes, that he's been overly suspicious, and this has to be his son Esau, because he smells in a way that an outdoorsman would smell. So that leads us to the final uh, verses in our focal verses here today, verses uh, 28, 29, and 30, where he, Isaac, is going to impart the blessing upon Jacob, whom he, which he does, of course, mistakenly not realizing that it's Jacob that he's giving the blessing to. So we pick up with verse 28, and we'll read 28 through 30. May God give to you from the dew of the sky and from the richness of the land an abundance of grain and new wine. May peoples serve you and nations bow in worship to you. Be master over your relatives. May your brother's sons bow in worship to you. Those who curse you will be cursed and those who bless you will be blessed. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob and Jacob had left the presence of his father Isaac, his brother Esau arrived from his hunting. Whoa, wow. These verses contain Isaac's fourfold blessing. We're going to dissect those, look at them in a little more uh, specificity here, and break them down. He begins, Isaac does, with the first element addressed agricultural success. Well, this being an agrarian society, uh, everything pretty much depended on success of agriculture for success of anywhere else. So it's not at all surprising that that's the first thing that um, Isaac is going to do when he blesses whom he thinks is Esau. Now Esau was not a farmer, so it's interesting that this would come first. Esau, remember, was a hunter, but agricultural success would be imperative for anybody in that culture. So Isaac is going to give that, that blessing first. First thing he says is that your crops, your harvest, will be plentiful. Well, as I said, he's not a farmer, but he would rule over people that were if the blessing were carried out. And may your herds ever present and increase in number. Well, that's so important to this agrarian society that they, they were not just farmers, they were also herdsmen. So, as we said, goats were a major part of who they are about, as well as sheep and some cattle and donkeys and other types of animals. Now, the dew of the land, having visited Israel, a couple of years ago, uh, they get a lot of their moisture from dew. The rainfall for much of the country is not very great, but being next to the Mediterranean, dews are fairly heavy, and they do a pretty decent job of watering certain plants there. So the dews is something that everyone that lived in that area would fully understand. Plus, Dews come from heaven, so in a sense, Isaac is asking for heaven's blessing upon his son. And then the, the second part of that, he wanted his, his uh, son 
to receive the blessings from the earth. And that's where we see the richness of the land coming into the blessing that he's passing on here. So dew coming from heaven, richness of the earth coming also from God, but in the form of land, productive land. And then the second part of this fourfold blessing is he wanted his son to be respected internationally. That is, among the other nations around them there, that he would have success, the peoples would, would respect him, nations would respect him, and they would actually do more than respect him. They would pay homage to him. They would bow down to him, and he would become successful. Well, that part of the blessing is ultimately going to be played out when David becomes king, a descendant of, of Jacob, and rule over a vast area and then Solomon even more so. So th this blessing was definitely fulfilled. That he would have authority over his whole family is the third part of this blessing. And though it's going to take a while, it ultimately is fulfilled. Yeah, he go has to run for his life, literally keep Esau from killing him after what happened here. And he stays gone for a good long while. And when he comes back, uh, things have been settled down between he and Esau. And we'll study that a little bit later on. And then uh, Isaac spoke pretty much the same thing that God told his dad, Abraham. He spoke a blessing on those who blessed his son, and he spoke curses on those who cursed him. So he passed his blessing on to him. The way things work, you can't take that blessing back once it's given. Once it's given, it's given, and there's no changing it. So Jacob receives the blessing, and he leaves as quickly as he can. He exits, and he did not linger around. Good thing he didn't because Esau comes in shortly after Jacob leaves. They did not encounter each other in Jacob's leaving. It's uh, part of God's plan that they didn't. I feel certain that Esau probably would have killed his brother or certainly would have attempted to do so. So while Jacob was absolutely wrong in everything that he did, Rebecca is equally wrong, maybe even more so than him, in deceiving the aged blind father. In the end, Isaac's plan could not prevent God's will from being carried out. God did ultimately fulfill his role, his purpose for Israel, as later on Jacob's name will be changed to. Through Jacob, and that's what he revealed to Rebekah before all of this happened and possibly contributed to her creating the plan that she created. In closing, there's a, there was a very influential man of the faith uh, back a couple of, well, more than a couple, several decades ago by the name of R.G. Lee. He was an important leader in Christian circles. He was a man of very devout and strong faith. He's written quite a few things. I'm sure if you Google him, you can find some of his writings. He had a, a, a quote <laughs> that I read many years ago, and I have used it multiple times myself in teaching. Brother Lee said, and I quote, God can strike a powerful straight blow even using a crooked stick. God can strike a powerful straight blow even using a crooked stick. Well, Jacob definitely was a crooked stick. No question about that. As we've pointed out, he broke numerous 
of the commandments, did a number of things wrong, but God's hands were on him, and because of that, he fulfilled God's purpose in spite of the fact that he was a, quote, crooked stick. Thank you for joining us today. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for the fact that you can, your Lord, use even the likes of me, a crooked stick, to feather your kingdom here on earth. Father, I pray for everyone listening, those that are not in great health, Lord. May they feel your presence in a very special way today and in the days to come. Lord, may they know that you love them that you have their best interest at heart. Thank you, O oh Father, for your Son. Thank you for the promise of eternity with you through him. And it's in his name that I pray, God. Amen.